Hello, I hope we're going to have a lot of fun today because I've devised this fun exercise about neutrals, right? So um, neutrals, most people think of greys, but actually, if you have a look at this little picture here, um, kind of greys and browns and colours of stones and natural things, you know, you tend to think of neutrals as natural things. But if we we're going to define them, um, it's not just greys, it's kind of beige, grey, browny, um, and we think of neutral colours as kind of dull colours, you know. So we tend to kind of avoid neutrals a bit, I think, um, from my personal experience, from um, being really depressed about neutrals from mixing them from black and white all the time <laughs> whenever you need a gray if you mix it from black and white um sometimes you go yeah it's very grayy gray these are quite nice neutrals though aren't they they're attractive you know that's actually done with a, a limited palette called a zonin palette but i'm going to be using a limited palette of colors today but we're gonna get beautiful neutral colors from it right this is my little promise to you because i have been going ooh and ah all week over these colors and i'm also going to show you the usefulness so the exercise is devised to show you the usefulness of them so if you are um sitting around with your paints or you turn up later with your paints and you want to work along uh you will need to know that the reference photos are over on the community tab and i've just posted them but i've actually posted a photo yesterday as well which is very useful there are five photos posted today and there's one posted yesterday and you'll laugh when you see what the photos are there you get a clue from the thumbnail of today's live but uh they're eggs. <laughs> and um, an egg is a great um, reflector of light and um, is a curved object, isn't it? So it's got shadow. And this is where our neutrals are going to come into their own <coughs> in shadow. OK, so uh, to just to define neutrals, neutral colors are muted shades and they appear to lack color, but often have underlying hues that change with different lighting. And people often use uh, neutrals in interior design, you know, painting your uh, wall in your living room, mushroom color which I'm very fond of, or a grey, and you'll sit there agonising over which shade of grey. How do you get different shades of greys? Well, it's not just mixing in different blacks and whites with something. And you, you might say, well, you know, I'm not that interested in, you know, I don't use a lot of greys in my paintings. Ah, you might use a lot of neutrals in your paintings with the addition of black, okay? And I do this myself. Oh, this is kind of a new way of doing things for me. But I had kind of been doing it to a certain extent instinctively, but not really knowing how to do it. And the range of applications for this is amazing because you can use it for landscape, portraits, still lives, abstract painting even, you know. So look, we'll just get under rain and see how fab it is. So I have my palette out and I have uh, three main colours on the palette. I have a yellow, which is a cadmium yellow. I have a blue, which is a thalo blue. And I have a red, which is an alizarin crimson. But you might have different versions of these colours. But the point is that we are working with mainly three colours. And I have added uh, white onto my palette, which isn't really considered a, a hue. A color if you like um we ha we had been working with color previously right and we had made this on a previous live stream about uh, color this color wheel and this color wheel has your yellow blue and red on it and then it has secondary colors that are mixed from a mix of for example the yellow and the red make an orange which is a secondary color 
And then on either side of that, there are tertiary colors as well. So those colors are uh, for the orange, for example, it's a very reddish orange on this side, but on this side it's a very yellowy orange because the wheel um, shows what direction colors are leaning towards. So that even in a yellow, you could have a warm yellow or a cool yellow. And the same in the blue, we've got the uh, primary color repeated out here, but we have ter uh, secondary colors here. Orange was a secondary color for yellow and red. Uh, this is supposed to be a purple, but uh, this kind of blue, this ultramarine blue and red, uh, don't make a very nice purple together. So some of the color matching that we're going to try and do today, you might see me take out different kinds of blues or different kinds of reds. And I actually do have a different kind of green out on my palette even though you can make green with red, uh, with yellow and blue. It's a secondary color made from two primaries, yellow and blue. The green it makes isn't particularly bright. So for example, if you have a look at the photos that I have, one of the eggs, um, I have a brownish kind of an egg, this color egg, but the backgrounds that it's on, um, they're very colorful backgrounds. And this is because we want to have a look at um, the shadows on them. Say, for example, we were doing a portrait of somebody and I do have a portrait photo there for people to work from if they want to try doing a portrait. And we are going to do part of the exercise from that portrait as well. Um, there's going to be some shadow on it, depending on where the light is coming from. In the photo, the shadow is it, the shadow is going to be on the left side. That shadow color is so hard to get unless you understand the concept of the uh, color wheel. You can get it with black, you're darkening down whatever color your egg is with black. But this is uh, this way. I'm going to show you is amazing, right? So I have the photos all numbered. So I'm um, I'm looking at the photos here in front of me, and the first photo is actually numbered number one in the corner, is our little egg model. Um, on a sitting on a quite a vibrant pink background, right? So say you're doing a portrait of somebody, this is what you have to deal with. You have to deal with skin colors and shadows that are on a 3D surface, the face, and you have to deal with surrounding colors and neutral colors really come into their own. So let's see, can we get a pink color first? And um, I'm working today in oil paints. And I'm having to use a white in with the in with the red because I want to bring up that tone. And the red is, if you if you look at it, the red is not going to be a great match for the pink. There is another way, another kind of red you can use for that. It's actually a purple. If you use a magenta, a more magenta red, you're going to get a better color for that. But because I'm using a limited palette, I'm okay with this kind of color personally. Okay. But this is why a limited palette is called limited. It's limited as, as to what kind of colors you can get. But I don't mind because I'm explaining the color concept here more than anything. So why am I doing the background then instead of the color of the object? Well, it should be uh, somewhat obvious that I have said it already, haven't I? That the color of the background is going to influence the object, isn't it? So we'll say that's the pink, even though it's not a perfect match for the pink. It is the, uh, the pink part of the color wheel. And you could mix it up with a slightly more purpley pink or a magenta color. I do have a magenta somewhere in my oil paints, but you see, I'd be here all day if I was trying to match the color perfectly because I have a lot of exercises I want to get through and I want to show you the principle of this. Okay, so there's our background color. Uh, we're going to do the egg 
color now. Okay, so we're looking for skin color and I don't really have to clean off the brush here. Uh, we're using white, which is a not saturated color. Okay, it's a kind of a desaturating color that desaturates other colors. So I had a bit of the, the crimson on my brush already, didn't I? Now, um, the egg is kind of a brownie color. So I'm going to add some yellow. I'm going to add more of the pink mix that I had. So already we're getting nearer to a skin color, aren't we? So I'm kind of side on today. I put things in a different place. So we're going to put in an egg color. And I'm not going to bother with the shape. Because as I say, this is a fairly quickie session. This is an hour. And we're, it's color mixing we're doing today, mainly. Okay. So this is the skin color in the middle of a pink background. Now, what I want to do is do shadow in that. But there's also light hitting the object. So I am going to do the highlight on the egg as well. And for the highlight, I'm going to get a different brush because uh, if you look at that photo, photo number one on the community tab, you might notice that the highlight on this egg color is the color of the object, which is called the local color, this kind of skin color, right? And it's a Caucasian skin color, isn't it? Because we have somebody who's black for our model today for one of the photos. So it's going to be a different color we're going to use for her. Uh, but it's got white added to it. And it's going to also have a tiny little bit of blue in it. Just a tiny bit because blue is a very um, takey overy kind of color, depending on what sort of blue you use. So I'm adding more white because it's needs to come up a bit in value which just means how light or dark it is so we have a sort of a bluey white so we're you know we're working with neutral this wasn't a neutral really this wasn't um a neutral is going to be something that doesn't really turn up in any of these colors on our wheel because it's a mixture of um, not just the secondary colors, not just the primary colors, not just the secondary colors, not even the tertiary colors. It's kind of uh, a mix of what we'll find out is colors from the opposite sides of the color wheel. But We'll, we've yet to get to that, right? So we're just getting the light on the object first. It's the shadows we'll start really exploring neutrals in. And that's when you'll start going, ooh. Now, look at this. Here's our highlighty bit, okay? So it's a blue-white. So we have to have a think about why that is. And why that is is because of the lighting because the light coming in is kind of a bluish white but it is um mixed with the local color that white with the bit of blue in it was mixed with the local color of the egg right so that's the color of the egg we're calling the local color okay uh this color when we get to the left side of the egg it's going to have some shadow area in it there's also going to be an area of reflected light that's kind of bounced up from this pink, this background pink. And this is why we had the pink in it. We also have very dark area out here of shadow. So it's a lot of color to deal with and to figure out what color something is can be quite tricky, right? But we can break it down to something simpler. So let's look at the shadow now. This is when we really get into the idea of complementary colors and how we can use them to make shadow. So if we have a look at the color wheel, and as I say, if you want to make one of these yourself for uh, your own reference, there are instructions on the three color videos uh, that are up 
their lives as well. So if you go back a, a few videos, you'll see those. Um, you can make one of these or if you want to freebie one, I've actually got one posted on the community tab. If you scroll back down through that, a few posts back, I've got one there that you can just print off if you want. Uh, so what we're doing here is to make a sh our shadow color, we're going to take this skin color or egg color, which we're kind of calling skin color because the egg is like a head and we're talking about the usefulness of it for portraits at the moment, just to make an analogy. And we're going to go on the opposite side of the color wheel. So we're going to find something that's kind of, you know, like the color on the color wheel. And on the color wheel here, I can see that this color is over here towards the reds, right? Which, like, I made it out of red, didn't I? And what is a good idea, I think, is if you actually write it down. Uh, I can't find a pencil, but I have a pen. I do have a pencil. If you write down your mixes, right, I am going to write down, it's going to be sideways for you, but I will write it down. It's, um, you know, mine was alizarin crimson, which is red. And it was a yellow, cadmium yellow. So write down what kind of yellow you used, what kind of red you use for your mixes. And uh, white, it's a titanium white. And that was the mix for the skin color, egg color. And then the mix for this was plus uh, blue and more white as well. But And it was Thalo blue, P-T-H-A-L-O blue. So that's a good way to keep track of your color mixes because we're going to do different mixes, you see. So uh, for this shadow, what we're looking for is what's opposite this on the color wheel. And this is over on the red side. So if you look over on the red side, um, you've got greens opposite. You see? So we're kind of somewhere between that. Uh, if you put more white in that, you pre pretty much have that color. So we'll say it's over here in the greens. And how do you make a green? Green is a secondary color, isn't it? So it's blue and yellow. So let's stick some blue and yellow into that color and see how it looks. Now, blue, didn't I say blue is a really dark color? And we want to also keep some of the original color and be able to mix up the original color again. You get really good at mixing doing this, you see. So it's a great exercise like that. And to, to make that original color, because I don't have enough going on over here. So I had white, red, and yellow. Gosh. Now, get more of that going on in here. Now, look at what's happening here. We've got a greenish color. It's not very dark. So let's go with more red, more blue, and more yellow. So all we're doing when we're doing that more red, more blue, more yellow, when you think about it, we're taking more of the white out of it by adding colors back in. Now we're getting darker, aren't we? So when we look at the shadow, we just have to decide how much leaning towards the red the shadow is, you see, and how much leaning towards the green. So, you know, it's got red and green in it. They're complementaries, opposite sides of the color wheel. And this is why you need the color wheel to refer to this. But then when you're when you've mixed them up, you're saying, okay, does the color lean towards more more towards the red or more towards the green? And it leans uh, in the top of that egg, it leans more towards the red, definitely. And I'm gonna put some more yellow in it as well because it's a warm red. And it's quite um it's quite a dark color. You see the way that's warming up greatly? Oops. It's actually, I'm actually going out of shot a bit there. Now that is a, such a beautiful brown. But as I added colors in there, 
you could see the color um, changing because it was started leaning towards uh, brown, then it was leaning towards purple, then it was leaning towards uh, more red, depending on how much yellow I put in, how much blue I put in, or how much red I put in. And that's basically it. Um, it's very harmonious way to approach shadows because it's made up of the colors you're already using. It's not getting a black, which is, you can have different types of blacks. You can have a black that's just a blue, bluish black, for example. Um, it's not just taking the blue end of the spectrum and mixing it in your color. It's um, a, a mixture of everything that's on your palette already that you used for that local color of the egg. So it's got a beautiful uh, depth to it, you know, the color. And when you start using these colors like this, you do go ooh and ah, because we're going to do something else because that shadow changes a little bit as it comes down. It goes warmer. And I would say slightly brighter. Now, we all see a bit differently, okay? So you might see it differently to me. But I'm bringing it warmer by adding more red and more yellow. So again, looking at your color wheel, you can understand what's what's happening. We're going uh, back from the blue towards this now end of things. And you can see how that is a beautiful transition. Oh, I'm hoping you can see it because it is very subtle, you see. This adds a subtlety to your painting that you're going to love. <laughs> you're really going to love it, you know. And even if that shadow, um, the kind of uh, lovely transitions in the shadow, even if it started going lighter, that's fine because you just come along. And you add a little bit of white into that color. You see the way you can have a lovely transition with the same mix, depending on whether you want to lean more towards um, that side of things or that side of things. But you're you're basically um, saying, OK, my local color, my local color is nearest to this on the color wheel then I am going to go right across the color wheel to the opposite side and mix that color in with it to get a shadow. And then it's just a question of, you know, how do I get it darker and lighter? And we didn't have to go near black to do that at all. Oh, I have blue on it now somehow. OK, so out here, um, there's a lot more color going on. Um, we don't really mind uh, too much about the fact that the local color can still have a lot of the original color bounced back, okay? The whole thing isn't in shadow, in other words. That's a different kind of a lesson, okay? <laughs> we can't do everything in one day. So this is why I'm simplifying things a little bit. And I did have a little bit of brown left on that, so I'm having to do a lot of work to get rid of it off my palette. But these won't go to waste. I have a lot of oil paint is dear, but none of it's going to go to waste because we can use it later. Now, I'm going to make that a little bit lighter. So I warm that up quite a bit. And I'm going to go lighter. So this takes into account the local color. This uh, reflection, bounced light reflection. It takes into account it's even warm. It goes even warm. The bounced light and uh, the light from the uh, what's around it as well, which is that kind of quite hot pink. We could uh, go in and explore the shadows with neutral colors as well because I have a what kind of, I've got a very greeny color on my palette at the moment but that shadow is it's going to be uh, 
darkest here, right? Uh, when it's near the object, because the least light is getting in here. It's going to be lighter areas here, but it can all be done with really dark versions. If I can find another brush, so I don't have to keep cleaning brushes. Really dark versions of the same thing. Oh, hello, person in, in chat. The subtlety is visible. That is great. <laughs> and um, hopefully you'll enjoy this colour mixing experiment as well. Because uh, subtlety is where it's at. Huh? So we're getting really dark colours here. And sorry, I'm, I have to spin this around. Again. But I'm on my blue and red kick again now, right, for these dark colours. So we'd already used these, hadn't we, in our mixes. So these are not like going to look weird on the palette. We're not introducing a totally unrelated colour. The only way in which it's unrelated is its darkness so far. And when I'm looking at uh, that dark colour, um. I'm happy enough that that is a, a, a kind of a, to me, it's kind of a blue black because this is a pink background and the darkest black for me was a blue black. So I'm happy to do that. So you can see how you can uh, keep using the same colors for, you know, that's not a neutral tone. I wouldn't call that a neutral tone. It's far too dark to be uh, neutral. It's not, you know, it's a very blue, black color, but uh, a neutral can be very dark. So just the fact that something's dark doesn't mean you're not going to call it a neutral, you know. So uh, I'm going to bring that up lighter though, because up here, we're going to do that little gradation again. And in the gradation, it moves from being in the blue part up to towards being warmer in the red part. So that's all you're doing. You're going around the wheel to judge where on the wheel that color is. And you're going to add a little bit extra to the color that you just mixed in order to get that. And I bring it up a bit lighter as well. OK, so I'm not going to spend too long messing around with that because we want to get back to the neutrals that are right in there in that shadow area and doing more complementary mixing. But look at the colours, aren't they? Ooh. <laughs> They're so nice, aren't they? And uh, next week, I am now dying to do um, an abstract painting using uh, neutral colours, basically mixing complementary colours and keeping the palette, uh, very muted colours on the palette. And the reason that I, in this uh, exercise, included very warm colours as well in backgrounds and everything was that I wanted to show you that neutrals don't exist just in this neutral world in their own you can do a whole painting in neutrals like that one I was showing you earlier. They're all very neutral, kind of mid tony neutrals, greys and browns and things. But, um, you know, using greys doesn't mean the whole painting has to be in greys or that it all looks grey, you know. Uh, it's actually an incredibly colourful experience mis uh, mixing complementaries, but um, using your colour wheel to mix complementaries and use them as shadow is it solves a lot of problems in painting for you you know and I haven't gone through all the tones in that egg but it's a great exercise to do and if you want to draw it out as an egg shape first and do all your tones and everything on it um you know that's another totally legitimate way to, to go you'll spend longer on it than me but uh, this is a nice way to do it too. So I'm going to do the second one and do experiments with that. I'm going to end up with this kind of abstract looking thing, but it, that's cool. <laughs> now, the next one, uh, the photo number two on the community tab, it's it's not dissimilar, right? All that's happening is that your alizarin colour is a lot hotter. 
but I have I have the skin color kind of mixed here, so I'll reuse that color for the skin color first, okay? Keep calling it skin color, it's egg color. But I'm thinking of it as skin because um think of this for portraits. This technique for getting you around a head in portraits. Okay, so we've got our main color here in the middle of the object, but the background is much hotter color than the color that we had in for our pink last time. Okay, now I did say I, I can't get like super hot colors. I could with the I can get it a hot color, but I don't know if I can. Oh, it's not bad actually for this color. It wasn't great for the other sorts of pink, but it's not bad for this one. Okay, so this is a lot more saturated a color. Slightly dirty down because my brush, I didn't clean my brush. I was a bit lazy about the brush, but near enough. And uh, just to show you, this one I'll do fairly quick because it's a very similar idea to the last one. Just to show you that the intensity of the color uh, doesn't really matter. The technique is still the same, you know. So the edge, the bounced back light on this one is uh, looks much hotter than photo number one. If you were to flick back and forth between photo number one and photo number two, uh, you would see that although they're both on a pink background, uh, this bounced light on the egg is going to look a lot hotter than this bounced light here on the lighter pink color. And that's just because of our perception of color in a way, because uh, it's only very slightly hotter. And a little, um, sometimes our eyes get a little bit confused because there's a thing about relative color as well, you see. So it, it depends, the way you see a color depends on what colors are around it, basically, is that principle. So um, a little thing you can do to isolate a color that's very useful is this little viewfinder thing. If you're trying to figure out what color something is to see, like what color it's nearest on the color wheel, um, this, holding this up to it can help you isolate that color. So if you're trying to decide, is that color there the same color as the bounced light on the photo number two edge. Uh, you, you can hold your little thing up to your number one photo and then you hold it up to the edge of number two photo and then make your decision, you know. So um, I'm going to say, yeah, it's a little bit warmer, but not a whole lot. So it's just mixing in more yellow, isn't it, really? So uh, that is there. There's the skin color there. And take some of the red. And I could have added a cadmium red onto the palette, but um, I am settling for slight generalization about things. You'll have longer to do the exercise if you wanted to do the exercise yourself. So here's the color view. Now, you see the way that's not, um, you know, it's not a wildly different color from that one, but uh, it's definitely warmer. Not much, not very much warmer. So this exercise uh, builds your ability to see color better, more accurately for you. Anyway, more accurately for you, I should say. Because the way we see color and the way you actually measure color, say you're working on a computer or something, measuring what amounts of, of different hues are in colors and everything might be quite different because humans see color subjectively, you know. And even the fact that on the second one, I don't have the shadow color in. And the shadow color might be different from the first one, but I haven't put it in at all um, on this one. 
that affects how I see that color. So this is why these exercises, when you're doing them, they're really building up um, how you're seeing color and making you a more sensitive instrument for seeing color. You know, and everything changes how you see color. Just putting a little highlight in on something changes how you see color, you know. But um, this is so useful for anything you're painting. And uh, it's opening up a whole new world of really, really subtle colors, you see. So let's move on a little bit. And I don't know how I'm going to do this space-wise, but I might move things around this way a bit. Hang on. I'll just move up. So we'll we'll go on to the third exercise. And um I'm just doing all these side by side on the page so I can look at them all together. Um you might I could have done them on a neutral background, that's the other way to go, but I wanted to show you how to mix up a neutral color first. So we didn't really have, uh, when we started, we didn't really have a grey that was just made from something that wasn't black and white, you know. Um, so I had to explain how to do the complementary colour mix before we even got there. But you could do your background all in a sort of a neutral colour like that if you wanted to. Because white even affects how you read something. Uh, let's look at how... If I fill in, in between these two, before we move on to the next one, fill in all the areas that are white with a neutral colour. How that changes the look of the thing, you see? I have left some out because I, I, I wanted to leave that mark for what the colours are. And I would advise if you're new to doing this, maybe write down what colours you're using. Uh, I'm not being terribly fussy about it here, but I could have written down what my colour mixes were here. It's You can't really write down what amounts you're mixing in. There's no point, I don't think, because it's um, different for each pigment has a different amount of pigment in it. You know, so the blue has more staining power than um, than a different color might have. And what kind of blue you're using it affects the staining power as well, you see. But look at this when the white goes. Um, it's quite a different effect, isn't it? And if I get something which is a neutral color and I get rid of the rest of the white on, look at that. It looks like a painting already, doesn't it? And it looks quite uh, elegant and funky. So already, you know, you get the basis for making beautiful abstract painting. And you can enjoy looking at uh, what colours come forward, what colours recede and everything. Um, and all this with neutral colours. The subtlety of it is the moment that you start going wow about it and start thinking it's really cool, you know. Let's go on to the third one because this is a very short live stream and I always end up very rushed, but um, we do have 15 minutes left. And you're sort of getting the idea, aren't you? So the next one has a green background. And um, just to talk to you about for a second why I'm not using a completely um, what I would call limited palette. And that is because... Um, well, I might actually get away with it. The blue and the yellow that I have uh, don't make a very vibrant green. And I'm not sure that I can make a vibrant enough green with Taylor blue and cadmium yellow. It's not, oh, it's not bad, but, you know, I'm having to do a lot of messing and it's very nearly there, actually. But uh, Viridian is a more pumped up green. And this is why a uh, limited palette doesn't always work for these things. So be aware of that when you're mixing colors. If you can't get um, like that first one with the pink, 
was a tricky little one to get with the colours that I was using. Uh, that's probably why. But at the same time, you know, um, you don't actually have to get the colours bang on for this exercise to be able to appreciate it. They just have to be in the light zone. Try and get them right uh, tonally to the right place. There we are. So we'll say this is the background for the third one. Oh, it could actually be a bit zoom here. You see, I am having a bit of problems with that color there. It's very sappy green. Whereas, look at if I do it in Viridian instead with the same yellow. It's just... It's zoomier, isn't it? That's why, you know, I call it um, it's an ex extended limited palette. <laughs> OK, so we've got our green. Let's get our skin colour back. Whoops. Managed to get some green caught in that skin colour. Okay, so I'm painting over green, so it is it is picking up a little bit of green. So be aware of those issues as well. Um, sometimes you want that to happen, and sometimes it's accidentally nice, and sometimes it gets in the way. This has cooled down the colour more than I really want, uh, but it's still kind of okay, it can be saved. I might need more light to save it, but... Now that's more like the bottom part. Okay. And again, so there's the colour we're working with. Neutral eggy colour. And we're going to go to the opposite side of the wheel again. So that colour, we knew that was there. So it's a green colour. And this is a pale version of green I'm mixing in with it but you can see how it's already becoming more neutral now but uh, we want it darker than that don't we and it's got a kind of a brownie hue as well so we're going to add a little bit of red So it's a green, all right, but it's heading more. It's a green that's headed more towards the kind of. Um, it's headed more towards the purple end of things. And whoops, sorry, I actually hit you with my glasses there. So there's your shadow color there. So when you're talking about neutrals, the colours you're talking about and the combinations you're talking about are as follows. And I will write this down. So colours to try combining are red and green. And if I get the colour wheel out again, you'll see... Uh, red over here, green over here, opposite sides, okay? Red, green, blue, orange, blue and orange, opposite sides, again, complementaries. And uh, purple and yellow. And we're sideways, so I'll just give you a shot of that for a second. Right way up. I forgot I was sideways. So they are your complementaries. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, no, there's nothing to stop you, uh, you know, using black and white as well for a grey but uh, you're not going to be coming up with these range of colours here are you for those shadows or for the dark shadows it's going to be it's going to look a bit different 
So what way will we go now? We'll go this way and do another one. Okay, so I I have generalized about a lot of things there, but I think, you know, I didn't bother putting in the highlight or anything there. The highlight stays the same color. It's the same lighting. And for the background, you can see how the shadow, the cast shadow, we were getting those colors pretty easily from the same combination of colors without having to go near our black. There's no law saying you can't add a little bit of black in if you want, but to do it with uh, these colors first is exciting. The last one, the number four photo, I did it with this red ball instead of the egg, right? Because I wanted to sort of prove the point, and the point being that, um, you know, you will wonder about this after a while. You sort of say to yourself, well, uh, OK, but you're using a kind of a skin color thing there, you know. Um, what about if it's a colored ball, a colored shape? And again, I'm not going to match exactly the light red for this, probably with this alizarin. Uh, it needs a cadmium or a scarlet lake or something like that. And the mice actually, because I need the intensity of color in this one. So I'm going to use that alizarin. Let's see what I got. Have you any mice? Uh, do you cadmium? Yeah, I have a cadmium here. That's a more orangey red. So, you know, because pigments are made with, you know, uh, other pigments in them sometimes that you can't take out. Sometimes you can't get the right colour you're looking for. Uh, and you need to have an extended palette. So I wanted it that zoomy red. So I needed to and it's it's even a little bit not zoomy enough for me. We'll do this one circular just to be different. Now, in the middle of that, or we'll do it to the side, actually. Uh, we've got a highlight. And over on that side, we've got a couple of things going on. We have our green. Do I have a brush with green loaded on it or anything like it? I'm running out of space, you see, on this palette. just indicate a uh, green background because the white is very uh, irritating for the eye. You know, even seeing some of the white left there is it throws you. It's very hard to judge color. That's why you um, see me doing underpainting a lot of the time. But you, there's nothing to stop you doing an underpainting in a neutral gray or a neutral brown. And then painting these over if you want to do things that way. Okay, so uh, for this shadow, it's just exactly, it works exactly the same. So uh, we just look at the red and go right across and the opposite to red is green, isn't it? So we actually made the green from two different colors, if you remember. So we had, we actually used a, a viridian, a bit of viridian green to give it a bouncy green. So we got our green there. So let's add the green into the red. And look at that wonderful color, isn't it beautiful? Now, um. Now, once I get the color right, let me show you something. It's a beautiful color. But once I get the color, I have to decide, is that exactly the color I want, right? Uh, and I can hold up the thing here. And I can even do things like put a little bit of color on the piece of paper and hold it up to the photo. Or better still, if... You set up, I made these very simple objects so that you could set them up yourself on front of you. So you're seeing the things in real light with your own eyes. I always prefer that to photography. Photography is supposed to be able to see as much at really high resolution as you can. But it sees differently, you know, it just does it differently. So I prefer eyes and I like all the 
subjective stuff that goes into that as well. So I would decide personally that this is more towards the, you know, the shadow is, it's got various um, aspects to it, but I would decide that this part of the shadow is more towards the purple end of things, the dark part of the shadow at least. And I would act accordingly, wouldn't I? Because I'd get my red and my blue out and make it a little bit more purpley. Whoops. Keep getting other colours sneak into it. So up here, it's going to be more purpley. However, uh, that bounce light, be aware that the bounce light is going to take some colour from the background. So if your background was a greeny colour, right? The bounce light is going to be a greeny colour mixed with your local colour, which is red in this case. OK, so you go back into your red that you had. With your greeny colour and you might need to bring it up or down. Um, tonely with white. Okay, so that shadow colour can change a little bit, but it's kind of harmonious because it's got some of the red in it. Didn't come up bright enough with it, but it's got some of the white in with it, but it's uh, harmonious with the background as so. well. My brushes are a little bit dirty for that one, but not to worry, you got the idea. So I'll try and um, I'll try and do a cleaner version for the last exercise, which is using a head, right? And um, our lovely model is photo number five there. And I love this photo because uh, she's got a beautiful skin tone to start with. And it's a lovely kind of a, a sienna in some places and an ochre in other places but we can see some bluey purpley colors and some neutrals going on as well and highlights that are you know sort of blue light highlights and all the color transitions in the face are shown very well and in this photo there were two areas of the face that I thought showed it really well in terms of the kind of exercise that we were doing. And if this is the face here, right? Um, and the eyes here. It was up here on the skull I was very interested in because of this transition of light across the forehead. And she has a nice shaved head for us which is very helpful. And then down here, you've got nice bounce light coming back and then a transition into a darker area here. So those two areas I have um, separated out and put them to the right of the photo. But there's a link to the whole photo if you want to have a go at doing those exercises and doing doing a portrait afterwards using the principles that we were um, trying out of mixing complementaries to make shadows that are from neutral colours, basically. Uh, you know, I left the photo up there for you to try it if you want. So let's have a look at the transition of colour across um, the side of the chin area, right? So we'll just make this uh, sort of triangular shape to um, Sean Scully. Yeah, I haven't thought about Sean Scully for ages. Uh, Sean Scully um, does a lot of kind of strips of colour, doesn't he? The last things I saw of his, now I haven't seen him in ages, but the last ones I saw of his were uh, sort of they wear greys, they were really dark greys and whites, off whites he was working with. So yeah, I guess they were neutrals really. Not very well up on Sean Scully. You know who I was thinking about a lot doing this? I was thinking about um Deben Corn. Is that his name? Deben Corn or Deben Corn, one of the abstract expressions who does and I love his work. He does stuff they're like fields. And they're in all these kind of beautiful colours. He just does um, 
you know, like a field shape and then he'll do another slim field shape beside it and they're like an aerial perspective of field. And I was thinking, oh, I'd love to do something like that. Um, I'm torn next week between doing something Bauhausy because I really like uh, Bauhaus patterns, right? Would be really nice to do a Bauhaus, funky Bauhaus pattern with neutrals. Uh, I was torn between that and doing um, another abstract idea, which was um, doing a kind of a deep corn thing <laughs> of these kinds of shapes, oh, slightly overlapping things. And I can use arcs and shapes like that as well if I want and just have it a bit more free form. So I can't decide. Well, I know that um, on next week's live stream, I want to do something like that. So the first color I'm starting with here is a lovely kind of a, a warm brown color, which is kind of the middle shadow color. And there are paler versions of that going on as well. So I can do like transitions across that or I can um, change the color by bringing it up or pushing it down and I can transition the color across as well by adding and i'm using some of the color mixes i had already just because they're out but i should add more white <coughs> but like i am i am referring to the reference photo so i'm just not really making it particularly um figurative you know and for this kind of an exercise you don't really need to i need a bit more blue for this edge because it's not the, you're not practicing really um, getting the, uh, getting the object looking like the object particularly. It's the color that you're exploring. Okay, so this edge here is a perfect example because this edge is her skin tone, but it's blue as well. So look what's going on. The two things have to go together. And then if it's too dark, we're just going lighter. And I want more, a little bit more of the brownie in it. And there we go. So we're bringing it up. So you can see how you can get nice subtle transitions in color that where the color really relates to each other. Um, and you know, it will if you're using black to do those shadows as well. It still will, but it has a more scattered all over the placey feeling to it. And sometimes um, you can get into this place where you're just using too much color. You're, you're getting, I find that I'm getting, um, reaching back into my box of colors all the time and saying, oh no, no, there's a little bit of this color and a little bit of that color. In it. And I'm getting out all these extra tubes of paint. I don't really need. And that the painting would be possibly more harmonious without. So I have to face facts <laughs> now and tell myself that, yeah, less is more sometimes. So um, different artists will find a different um, palette um, as their core palette, if you like, suits them. And for me, I liked the limited palette, but there would be certain other um, pigments, mixes, pre-mixed things that would sneak into it for me that I'd go, no, I can't do with that because I can't get the vibrancy I want, you know. OK, so you see how um, whether you, we were working on the chin shape in that portrait or if we were working on the skull shape, um, we get to cross over that uh, curved shape and make shadow from using complementary colors. So we're over on the cool side of the wheel, cool side of the spectrum, if you like, uh, because that's all it is. It's just, you know, it could be, it could be represented as a flash uh, strip as well, you know. Um, so we could have been over the blue side of things or the orange side of things, or we could have been over the green side of things or the purple side of things. But um, to where things meet, you see, shadows are where 
uh, the colors meet. Because when you think about what color is, the pigments may not be made of light, but color is made of light. So the way that you see it and everything, it's the way that you receive light. So think about, I suppose I could leave you with this idea, think about when you look at a color, what color do you see as the afterglow of that color after staring at a color? It's a complementary color, isn't it? You know? So uh, one other really cool thing uh, that I really like about this, right, is um, if I can find my palette knife. Oh, I'm not just, hope I don't stand on it and get paint on the place, but I don't quite know where I put the other palette knife, so this will have to do. At the end of the day, when you're cleaning your palette, right, I love this. Somebody put me on to this recently and I thought, thank you so much for this because I love it. You get all these neutral colours, right? Um, keep them. If if you're working in oil paints, they're going to last absolutely months. If you put them in a bit of cling film or tin foil or something like that, once you scrape them up, you've got these beautiful neutral colours on your palette. And uh, you can use those in your paintings afterwards. And when you're, um, even if you were using black, this will work. When you're making shadows for something, if you add in a little bit of that uh, neutral mid-tone in with your colors, um, you've got all the colors you're using already. This is once you're using the same palette, you know, if you were using a different starting palette, it's not going to be harmonious. but um, <coughs> that's going to make for harmonious uh, neutrals in your painting, isn't it? Which is just going to make a beautiful painting. But it's very different, isn't it? Uh, uh, oh, to keep that, look, at you. you can do what I did there. Look, little tin. That's from about a week, week and a half ago. Now, this neutral is a kind of a different colour. It's not as neutral as going towards the greeny blue end of things. But, you know, uh, you can mix all of those up together in a big uh, goop if you want. And you're in, you've got a, a wonderful kind of a, well, it's a taupe colour at the moment I have, but it's going to be something that's a neutral because it's all your original colours all mixed up. And it's fab. I love it. Look at it. It's so beautiful. Oh, my goodness. How beautiful is that? To paint with. So, you see, it's very inspiring. So, uh, Next week, uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to paint with neutrals. So, you know, don't worry if you haven't followed all the color things so far. You don't have a color reel or whatever. You'll still survive, okay, uh, next week. But it's very, um, it's going to be very different. And it's going to really extend if you've not used these before. Uh, if you've not worked in this way before, it's going to really extend your thinking and your usage of colour. And it's just, look, I can't stop painting with it. It's so beautiful. So many different, there's so many different shades of neutrals out there. And they're all very human, lovable kind of colours as well, you see. Because it's all the colours of the rainbow all mixed together, really, when you think about it which is what light is so of course it's going to be harmonious so yeah and I might be banging on a bit about uh, Bauhaus next week because the guy Itten right who I kept calling him Munsell for some reason I was looking at somebody else Munsell you see who came up with this colour here um, he was one of the people who worked with the Bauhaus you see on colour and they were in art school in the 20s in Germany in Weimar Germany and uh, they were hugely influential in all sorts of areas of art, architecture, um, design, all sorts of things. And um, did extensive studies of colour. So uh, some of their paintings are beautiful. And um, some of the ideas I'll be working with next week are from those. So have a go at some of these exercises and have fun with your neutrals and go ooh and ah while you're mixing them up. And then, uh, you know, even if you're left with a mess in your palette, it's a beautiful mess that you can um, scrape up and keep.
<laughs> we like that recycling <laughs> so thanks for dropping in and i hope you uh, enjoyed yourself yeah richard Diebengorn, that's his name he even spelled it right well done <laughs> thanks for that okay folks see ya